Hey guys, today we're gonna to be looking at a skid steer. First thing we're gonna do is do a circle check on it to check the tracks and the fluids in it. After that, we're gonna be able to show you how it works from start to finish. We'll also be able to show you two different attachments on the machine by doing some grading and some clearing. All right guys, the first thing we're gonna look at is the tracks. The first thing we're making sure of is the track has really good tension on it. If it seems loose, it will cause the track to actually walk off of the machine. There are a different couple of ways you can actually adjust the tension on the track. Some machines have a socket piece inside the casing where you can turn it to tighten it, and some have a grease fitting you pump up to tighten it. The next thing you're looking for is divots, cuts, or abrasions on the track itself to see if it has any kind of major tears in it or anything that would hinder the machine from being useful at a job site. If you have a wheel unit, what you're gonna be looking for there is major divots, cuts, or abrasions on the wheel as well. The difference is though, it's a tired machine. So you won't have to look for sprockets on that particular machine because everything is internal. On a wheeled unit, another thing to look at and make sure of is all of your bolts are tight that actually adhere the wheels to the machine on the axle it's on for your drive axles. After you get done looking at your tires or your tracks, we're gonna move on to the sprocket of the track unit, which is right here. The sprocket has teeth all the way around, which holds the track onto the machine. This is how you navigate yourself forward and backward for your motion of travel. If you see that a sprocket is either missing a tooth or if the sprocket appears to be bent or warped, you need to call in a service call immediately because this will hinder your machine from working correctly on the job site. We're now back at the engine compartment of this skid steer. What we're gonna be looking at first is the coolant level to make sure it's full. Note that you have a hot and a cold fill line. When it's hot, it will raise up right here because there's more coolant being pushed back in and vacuumed out. The next thing you're gonna be looking at is your engine oil. Make sure that you have an adequate amount of oil in the machine every single time prior to use. You wanna secure it in tightly to prevent any kind of oil from being exhausted from the dipstick area. Your oil fill is right next to it in the front area, and you wanna make sure off to the right here, where the air filter cap is, that it is tight. Once you've checked up here for any kind of signs of leaks or blatant damage, you're gonna go downward to where the other hoses and filters are. When you're down here, you have a coolant hose that runs to your coolant reservoir or to the radiator. After that, you're gonna be checking your hydraulic lines and filters. Make sure that there are no leaks on it and there are no frays or abrasions on the hose. This is very important. If you lose hydraulic pressure or oil pressure, you will be shut down on the job and you run the risk of destroying the engine. After you check everything for leaks or damage, you can move over to the right and you will see a green cap this is your fill spot for your fuel. Note that some skid steers have them in different locations and this varies from make and model, but nine times out of 10, they are in the rear of the skid steer. After checking the engine compartment, move around the entire machine checking all the hydraulic hoses. Ensure all the fittings are tight and free of leaks anywhere on the machine. If you do have a leak, refer to the operator's manual to properly tighten it or call in a service call and have someone come out and tighten it for you. When checking your grease fittings, which you should be doing every day prior to use of the machine, you need to make sure that you have a good healthy amount of grease on the outside of it. When you refer to the owner's manual, it will tell you what type of grease to use for the machine. While greasing the machine, you want to put grease into it until grease slightly protrudes out from the grease fitting. When getting into the skid steer, it's always very important to use three points of contact to not slip out of the machine or fall while getting in. You step up on the first step and grab the two handbars. You pull yourself up, then you move over to each of the taller handbars and the next foot step. You turn your body, they have a handbar on the outside and one on the inside, and you lower yourself into the seat. You need to make sure you put your seat belt on. Then you lower the lap bar down. The lap bar is a safety mechanism in the machine that will prevent you from operating if it is not down. Before we get started, let's go ahead and see what each control does before we get going so we know what we're doing with this skid steer. If you look at the left-hand joystick here, this controls the motion of travel for the skid steer. Forward will make you go forward. Pulling it back will make you go back. 
pushing it to the left will make you go left. Pulling it to the right will make you go right. Note that this button right here is your horn button on this particular skid steer. And let's move over to the right hand joystick. This is for your bucket controls. Pulling it back will make the entire arm go up. Pushing it down will make the entire arm go down. Turning it to the right will make the bucket lift up. Pulling it to the left will make the bucket go down. Note that this particular model is in SAE controls, not ISO. If we were to switch the controls around to ISO, it would simply mean the joysticks are reversed of what their actions are able to do. Now that we've got that covered, let's go up to how to start the machine. Right here, you will see a green button, which we would press once to start it up. The engine would then warm up. We would then press and hold it until the engine starts. Once it's started, you can get your engine to the appropriate RPMs for what you're doing right here. And once you're ready to start moving, you need to press the P button. This is the parking brake, which will allow you to unlock the brakes and be able to start moving the machine. Over to the left side here, we have your fuel gauge, we have your temperature gauge, your dash cluster to show any kind of codes or faults that you may have, and we have your hour meter screen. If a code were to pop up right here, you can simply go into the menu, press it, and then scroll down to where it says codes and hit select. Once you do that, you'll be able to see what it is to send in your service call and provide the technician a little bit more information on what's going on with the machine. Now that we've covered that, we are ready to go to work. Note though, some skid steers, the controls are all the same. They just may be in different spots on the skid steer when in the cab. When you're operating a skid steer, some things to keep in mind while you're doing this is always be aware of your surroundings to make sure that you don't have anything in the way, anything dangerous that may harm you, the machine, or the area that you're working in. Also keep in mind of your bucket placement to keep the grade as level as you can possibly make it for your ultimate goal of the grade that you're needing. So as you can see in the video right here where I'm driving through with the bucket slightly down, I'm scraping away at the surface level of the dirt and just trying to get it as level and even as I can to make sure that the grade's what I need it to be for my project. We're gonna disconnect the bucket so we can show you how to do that and we'll be able to reattach an attachment to the machine to show you the reverse order of it. Just note to always keep your hands safe when you're doing this. This is a pinch point and can actually cause you to jam your fingers if you're not careful while doing this. You're gonna come up behind the bucket and you're gonna see these two latches right here. This is actually your lock for the bucket to the skid steer. Step one, you just pull up on each side. Sometimes they get locked in pretty tight like this one right here. And it's always good to keep a small hammer inside the skid steer with you just in case to loosen it up. If this does not loosen it, you can start the skid steer and lift it up slightly. And this will help free and jar it loose. So we're gonna get back in the skid steer since this one's a little bit tighter to re-level the bucket to knock it loose. We should be able to just simply tilt the bucket and unattach ourselves from it. All right, now that we've gotten squared up with our bush hog, we should be able to come in and those latches that we lifted up to unhinge the bucket, we're gonna use them now to lock in the bush hog. You can simply do this by stepping out of the machine and pressing down on the locks. And now they're locked in and safe to secure the bush hog to the machine. We're gonna cut the machine off to hook up the hydraulic connections, which we will show you here in just a second. All 
always keep the machine off while you're hooking up hydraulic connections because of the pressure from them. You have typically two connections on it, which one is an inlet and one's an outlet for your hydraulic flow. You just match them up to where they fit at. So this is your bottom end, also known as your male connection. You're simply gonna press in on it and it'll lock onto that hydraulic fitting. This is your female connection. And now it's in. That's how you properly connect hydraulic fittings to your uh, skid steer. And this will get you good to go and you're now ready to use your attachment. All right guys, what we're looking at here is a six foot bush hog attachment for a skid steer. Some things to keep in mind while operating this, this is a very dangerous attachment. You have an open exposed area here with the blade that free spins. While you're doing that, you need to make sure there's nothing in front of you, such as people or anything along those lines, because this is dangerous and it will throw debris outward. Please note that this spins at roughly one to 4,000 RPMs a minute, depending on the make and model of the bush hog itself. While you're operating this, always keep in mind of your surroundings and what you're going towards so that you know what you're going over. A bush hog can typically take down somewhere between a one and three inch sapling tree with no issues. It's also good for cutting down underbrush such as briars and everything else, while keeping you as the operator safe because you're seeing what you're actually cutting down. When determining what size skid steer you may need for your project, keep in mind of the space you're working in and the area that you're working around. For example, using a walk-behind skid steer, also known as a walk-behind compact track loader, certain models such as the Toro Dingo is a great example, where they have less than a four foot in width area to operate in. At that point, they make them great for landscaping projects, that backyard project, or having to simply get through a gate in someone's backyard. The next thing you need to look at are your larger skid steers, such as this one behind me. This one has a lift capacity of 1,700 pounds and is able to move a lot more earth and a lot larger area than smaller ones. They do make larger models that are capable of lifting up to 4,000 pounds or greater, depending on the make and model. This all depends on what kind of project you're doing and where you're operating at. When you're using a wheeled skid steer, primary uses are typically operated on asphalt or in gravel, while track units are typically used in a more muddy area and dirt area for earthwork. With attachments that skid steers are capable of using, such as asphalt planers, forks for material handling or skid loading, also forestry mulchers for chewing up wood in forestry areas, or brush hogs to cut down low underbrush that you may need to get out of your way for hunting, trails, or joy riding with your kids on a four-wheeler. When you're using an attachment on a skid steer, whether it would be a forestry mulcher or a bush hog, or any of the other countless forms of attachments that you may have for your skid steer, there are a major difference you need to take a look at before operating the attachment. There is a standard flow machine and a high flow machine. These are different from skid steer to skid steer based off of how many gallons a minute the hydraulic pump is able to circulate through the machine to the attachment. This is based on 13 gallons a minute or more for a high flow and 12 gallons a minute or less for your standard flow machines. When you're looking at that, a forestry mulcher, which is an attachment for a skid steer, typically has 10,000 RPMs a minute on the mulcher attachment. This requires extra flow from the hydraulic fluid to turn this uh, attachment at that rate of speed. When you're running something like a bush hog, where the bush hog has a thousand RPMs a minute while rotating the blades, you do not need such a large pump to circulate the blades around like that to do your work. I hope this has answered a lot of your questions today. And if you have any more, always reach out to the dozer team. Don't forget to always do your pre-checks on a machine and make sure that all your attachments are tight to the machine. If you have any questions, like I said, give the dozer team a call and we'll always be there to help.